Good morning again, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. I hope you have grabbed drinks and some food. Please feel free to get up throughout the next hour. Replenish. It will still be here for you. Want to make sure that you guys have everything you need throughout the day. And I'd like to first off welcome you to our fifth annual Snoo Leads Conference. We did it. James in the front here has been to all five. So this guy, awesome. For those of you I haven't had the privilege to meet, my name is Helena Iaquinta. I am one of the assistant directors of online engagement. And I am lucky enough to work with an incredibly talented team of leaders in the Office of Online Engagement. Our mission is to provide experiences for students to connect, create, and build community. We do this through SNU Connect, our online environment, through academic learning communities, our leadership webinars, regional networking events, online clubs, and our online honor societies. Could our staff from the Office of Online Engagement please step forward so we can recognize you? I know Tiff Pfeiffer is in the back. We've got Gail Reynolds in the back here too. <laughs> awesome. In addition, we work for over 10 months of the year with the Office of Alumni Engagement to make sure this experience benefits current students and our phenomenal alumni. I'm always impressed at the level of care of this office, and if you are on the cusp of graduating and moving into an alumni status, I hope you will connect with our staff members throughout the day. Could our staff members from the Office of Alumni Engagement please step forward so we know who to connect with? We got Allie Snell in the back there. And Christy Durrett right in the back over here. So please make sure that you say hello to them because they have some great information to make sure you stay connected as you move into alumni status. So thank you for being here today, ladies. Um, you will also notice um, there are staff throughout the day that will be taking pictures, writing stories, and videoing a few of you today. Could our employees from the marketing and communication teams at SNU please stand to be recognized? You got Nina in the back there, she's got her camera. We got some guys in the back there, our wonderful gentleman in the back. Gil, our photographer, is here. Um, and you'll also notice a table set up with Blue Career in the back. If you guys would stand up, we've got Rich Grant and Jen Rivers. You guys now have a few faces to put names to, so I hope that you will say hello throughout the day. Um, we really want to make sure that this day runs smoothly and that you guys get the, the most out of it. So again, if you have questions, let us know. And you'll notice on the slides that we are using the hashtag SNU Leads. So if you would like to use that throughout the day, please do. Share your unique experiences with those of us who couldn't be here today. So, into my speech, are you ready? Today's conference is one of the largest events that our team hosts, and like the conference theme, we're th thrilled that you have made this event part of your journey to lead up. There will be almost 200 attendees here today, including students, alumni, staff, faculty, and guests. There's a wonderful mix of graduate and undergraduate students, of program-based and College for America, as well as alumni and a percentage of you who are involved in our online clubs and online honor societies. I would like to ask any of our past and present members of the Student Advisory Board or peer leaders to please rise. Awesome. Each of the people you see standing, you may sit, volunteered, and some are still volunteering their time to connect students on all forms of social media platforms. Most importantly, on our SNU Connect platform. If you are unsure what SNU Connect is or how you can get involved, please find one of the people that you just saw standing up to chat more about that today. One of our conference traditions is also to recognize how far you've traveled to be here. We have an amazing, report an unprecedented 23 states are represented today. So with that information, today's conference will present you with leadership challenges and we encourage you to choose your level of involvement. You can jump in with both feet or quietly observe, it's up to you. 
Today is about your willingness to lead up, and we challenge you to make new friends, ask a question in a session, sit at different tables throughout the day, smile, and shake hands with one another. You may have noticed that your name badge has a blank line at the bottom. I would like for you to take a moment and remove your name badge from the holder using the pens that are provided or one that you bought. Think of something that you're passionate about, that you wanna talk about with other attendees today. Maybe it's a hobby, maybe it's your degree program. I mentioned our College for America students, there's only five here today, so it's almost like a scavenger hunt to find them. <laughs> I will have you guys stand at lunch, unless you want to stand now. I know we've got Donna over here. Where are other College for America people? Stand up. Lynn. Oh, there you are. All right, I see four of you. Did you guys see each other? All right, good. We'll find the fifth one later. Um, it could even be that your company's looking for employees or that you're looking for an employer. Put that on the line that you have there and know that that's something that you guys can spark conversation with, whatever you would like. And throughout the day, when you introduce yourself to people, use that as a jumping off point to start that conversation. All right. A new addition this year will be the opportunity to win prizes. Snoo related, of course, for posting on social media. So we'll be watching the hashtag Snoo Leads on Twitter, Instagram, and Snoo Connect, and we'll pull one post from each space to win prize packages at the end of the day. So keep those phones charged, and don't forget to share your takeaways from the keynote session and your um, educational sessions today. Feel free to add photos as well. I've been told I'm extremely photogenic, so I'm open for <laughs> selfies. Yep, Gil said yes. Um, though please note that won't guarantee a winning entry. <laughs> Um, so, you'll have until about 3.10 today to post, so keep those posts going. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Renee Gaudet, who will introduce our keynote speaker for today. Thank you, Helena. Good morning. It's beautiful out. It's March. It's not snowing. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the fifth annual SNOO Leeds Conference. My name is Renee Gaudet. I'm an alumna from Southern New Hampshire University. I graduated last year with my Bachelor of Science in Healthcare Administration. <laughs> Woo! I'm a big proponent of every single person needs to go to graduation because it's unbelievable. Um, I am a team lead um, of surgical scheduling in patient access services at Mass General Hospital. In this room, we have the full diversity of SNU community present. I know we have current students, fellow alumni, staff, faculty, and guests. Today, we embark on a professional and personal journey together as we learn from our colleague and peer, colleagues and peers through many education sessions and informal opportunities to connect. You never know where these, leads, these connections will lead. I have a good one for that. Which is why I am especially honored to introduce our keynote speaker and my mentor, Ms. Ms. Katrina Jagrub Gomes. Um, once upon a time, I got a job at Mass General. And I was so excited and said, mm, the traffic's gonna be lousy, but it'll be okay. Well, then I found out that the waiting list for parking is six years long. <laughs> six. I'm almost five in. <laughs> so I met our keynote speaker on the train. Um, we always sit in the same train, same seats, and if someone sits in our seats, oh, it's on. <laughs> We're a bit of a train click. It took me a while to break in and get her to break down and accept us, or me. Um, but ever since then, she's been an awesome friend, a mentor. She held my hand through statistics. She gave me some really good advice that I want to pass on to every single one of you. Dress for the job you want, not the one you have. I am honored, and it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend and mentor, 
Katrina Jagrub Gomes. behind you and having my bachelor's degree opened a lot of doors for me my master's that's my dream the master's degree has opened doors for me in some ways but it's also for that credibility factor I need to be able to substantiate the things that I'm doing at an executive level and having the masters behind me it, it just gives you that extra that extra oomph behind what you're saying see myself taking my company to another level and I think SNHU has definitely been helping me throughout the process, giving me the correspondence with my peers and my professors and just being that platform, that sounding board and giving me the knowledge that I need to do that. When I look back at my experience on SNHU, I feel accomplished, I feel motivated, I feel like I can conquer anything and all the while I was still able to be a part of my family's life. I was just trying to make sure you guys were awake. <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> so first, let's give a round of applause to the Office of Online Engagement, the Office of Alumni and uh, Online, oh, Let's try that again, my nerves. Office of Online Engagement, Office of Alumni Engagement, the Avian Media Services, and Renee Godet for that wonderful introduction. <clears throat> so before we start, um, I have to apologize. I am battling a sinus infection, and I have not spoken in the last 24 hours to try to protect my voice for today. So you will have to forgive any coughing, clearing of the throat, throughout the presentation, so please forgive me. Um, want to talk about that video, though. Did anyone notice the eyebrow? Because I did. <laughs> I was like, wow, I can give The Rock a run for his money. Now I know why my husband tells me never play poker. Uh, as you're aware, my name is Katrina Jagrup Gomes. I attained my MBA in information technology in 2015. And today, my goal is to share my journey. Thank you to share my journey with you that had many twists and turns and obstacles that eventually led me to the position that I'm in, um, kind of the life position that I'm in as well. And I hope that the story that I share with you today will help you along with your journey. So firstly, just from a show of hands, how many of you are currently or were traditional students? And what I mean by that, traditional campus life, um, uh, you know, classroom style, just a show of hands. Okay, great. And how many of you are currently or were online students? Woo, okay, I feel you. Uh, how many of you are currently undergrads? All right, and grad programs? Fantastic. I have been you at some juncture in my life, so I really hope that my story resonates for you. So I started off my collegiate career in the same traditional sense most students do. I went off to college right out of high school. I was 17. And I worked part-time while going to school and struggled with acclimating to college life. Um, the independence, the mom not over your shoulder kind of concept. It was, it was really, really rough on me the first couple years. And fast forward to my junior year, I thought it would be a fantastic idea to get married and have a kid. Right? Because I was completely ready, wink, wink. Uh, but you know what? Life throws you curveballs. And I'm sure you've all experienced that one way or another. And you have to find a way to navigate a new path. And so after I finished my third year, I unfortunately had to drop out due to complications with my pregnancy and financial constraints. I had to make a choice. And unfortunately, school was the natural sacrifice. And I had a beautiful bouncing baby girl. You actually saw her in the video. That is my daughter. That's not a stage family, I promise. <laughs> um, and within a few years, I became a single mom and a divorcee. And it took me a few years to get my life back on track. And I quickly realized that I needed to go back to school. But the unfortunate part is that by the time I realized it took too many years, uh, too many years went by and I had to start all over again. 
And all the while trying to figure out how I was gonna pay for college, support my daughter and myself, and that leads me to my first takeaway. Hustle. And no, I'm not telling you to go blackjack and play 21 or anywhere else. Um, you've got to learn how to hustle. And what I mean by this is, there's no way I could afford college and support my daughter and myself at the time. So I found jobs that offered tuition reimbursement. Now back then, there weren't a lot of companies that were offering this, so you had to be really strategic. You had to find them. And so that's exactly what I did. And all the while, I was always looking for that next position, something a little higher, even out of my reach a little bit, to make sure that I got to the next level. And I transferred those credits that I, I earned. I actually got my associates um, at one of the, the community schools because it was cheaper, right? Money is really important when you're a mom. And transferred into Northeastern and then eventually got my undergrad from Suffolk University. Without being on the constant hunt and cognizant of the opportunities, I would not have achieved that goal. Attaining my Bachelor of Science in Business Administration Management was really important for me because it was not just for me and to provide a better life for my daughter, but it was to show her that no matter what life throws at you, you always make the time and make education a priority. I wanted to demonstrate that even while holding down a full-time job, being a mom, managing a household, volunteering, I made my education a priority, something I wanted her to learn. Now let me be clear, I had to have support systems in place that allowed me to attend a traditional classroom style setting because online classes were very few and far back then. And I had primary, secondary, tertiary backup babysitters. I mean, I had them on speed dial. Anybody who can go pick her up because coming from Boston every day, not easy. And I only went to school on nights that she actually got to spend with her dad. My second takeaway is being your best self. Taking advantage of educational programs and assessments available to you. For example, today. Today is filled with such rich and really true developed content for you to take and make part of yourself, make part of your being. And there are so many incredible se sessions that are available to you now that when I was doing my undergrad was not available to me. <clears throat> they help you learn about you and how to react and handle to different situations. I want to give you guys a, a little example, the DISC assessment. By a show of hands, how many people know what DISC is? Okay, a fair quantity of you. Myers-Briggs? Okay, more of you are familiar with that. DISC and Myers are a little similar. I just want to show you a little diagram here about you know, the different pieces of DISC. And so it's D-I-S-C, which translates to dominance, influence, compliance, and steadiness. And there are certain characteristics that falls within each of those quadrants. I, a long time ago, I believe it was in 2005, discovered I was a very, very high D. There's a shock. If you ask my husband, where is he? He's hiding over there somewhere. He'll tell you, yep, that sounds like my wife, high D. Um, and I realized there's nothing wrong with being a high D. It's actually one of the common traits in leaders and people who take executive roles. However, I wanted to really work on my collaboration and my team approach and, and a little bit more of a softness. And so I took steps, conscious steps, every day to work towards being collaborative and to being more supportive and being more approachable. It took a lot of work, I'm not going to lie. It, it is a conscious choice every day and decisions that you have to make to fight your natural inclinations to the point where it becomes habit, though, and that becomes your natural response. And the key to making something a habit is, can anyone tell me? Repetition. That's right, repetition. Repetition is the key to making something habit. So even though it's out of your comfort zone, even though it's, it's not natural to you, the more you make that conscious decision to do that every day, it becomes part of your natural being. Being cognizant of your strengths and weaknesses, I'm gonna go back over here for a second, are key to also improving and working on those things you would like to improve upon. For example, keeping a journal. No, not the dear diary, Johnny hurt my feelings type of diary. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that type of journal. The journal I'm talking about though, is really logging the things you did very well throughout the year, things you didn't do so well, things you could have done a little bit better. And then taking some time to review that and make notes. 
Um, I truly believe that I am a work in progress. Um, we can always strive to perfection, but no one's perfect. And so I personally use that as my own annual review. Like we all get one at work, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we did that to ourselves? And you can use this for both professional and personal development. It was really helpful for me in both facets of my life. And so at the end of the year, I would go through that journal, I would make those notes, and I would actually put a plan in place of the things I needed to work on in the next year. So they became New Year's goals. And then I would burn the journal. Don't burn your house down. Go outside. New Hampshire is beautiful. You can burn things. Um, but it, it was very cathartic for me. It, it was cleansing myself of the old and really rebuilding, a rebirth of sorts for the new year. The other key thing in, in <clears throat> being your best self is to learn from those around you. We interact and meet people and managers and peers and colleagues every day. Take the good, the bad, or the indifferent from each and every employer, manager, or peer and make notes of the things that they do exceptionally well that you admire them for, emulate it. Make it part of your DNA. That's what I did. Now, fast forward to 2013, and I saw all these commercials on TV about this university called SNHU. You guys know about those commercials, right? And I was really curious at first, because I didn't really know a whole lot about the institution, being a mass resident, been in Massachusetts most of my life, I know all about Boston schools, not a whole lot about New Hampshire schools. And so I contacted the admissions office, and they, were, they had the patience of a saint, let me tell you, because putting up with all the questions I had, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Nicole Wood was her name, I'll never forget her name, she was fantastic. And very quickly after several you know, conversations with Nicole, I decided, you know what, I think this is definitely for me. I wanted to go back to school, I wanted to get my master's. It was something I wanted to do for me. Uh, my first degree was really to illustrate to my daughter that no matter what comes your way, you've really got to pursue your education. The master's was also used to demonstrate that and, and to really emphasize that education is a priority, but it was really for me. I wanted that credential. I wanted the, that substantiation behind my experience. I had a lot of jobs. I worked. I hustled. I worked a lot of different positions, a lot of different roles, steadily climbing to the position that I'm in now. And with that, along the way, people are going to question you. Um, being a woman in STEM, how many STEM females do I have in the room? Okay, we're few and far between. You saw how many hands that got raised. It is really challenging. It is really difficult to be in that field without having that credibility. And so having the masters was that extra, I said it in the video, that extra oomph, that extra thing that I needed to be able to substantiate the recommendations, the changes, the different things that I was saying um, at work. <clears throat> On a side note, I do have to say the SNHU enrollment process and transferring of credits and meeting my advisor, Rob Benacasa, and I do have to give him a little shout out because he was really integral to my success. Uh, working with him during some difficult and stressful times, I actually ended up hospitalized once during my, my master's program, and Rob was with me the entire way. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is I really valued his counsel and friendship, but Rob was part of my support system, which takes me to, oop, I went backwards, sorry about that takes me to take away three, your support system. Rob was not my only support. We all have friends, family, and other resources that are avail, and we typically don't use them. No one is an island. I got remarried in 2010, and my biggest supporter and advocate is my husband. He's here today with me, so that should demonstrate how supportive he is. And we have a his and her office at home. And I really mean it's, it's hysterical. It, we have the exact same desk setups that mirror each other in, a, in our at-home office. So it's really funny. We can throw paper planes at each other if we want. And, you know. um, but while I was doing my master's and very, very late nights in the attic doing homework, my husband was right there by my side. And I would tell him, we both work full-time jobs. We commute to Boston. So that's a two-hour commute each way. And he was still up with me late at night till 2, sometimes 3 in the morning, and I have to get up at 5. And never left my side. And just having him there 
meant such a great deal to me. It just really made me feel so supportive and, and just, and not everyone can do that, but your partners, your families, your friends, your children, they can support you in different ways if you just let them. <clears throat> as I said, I commute to Boston every day. And as you heard earlier, I met Renee on the train. And so my friends were also on the train. I had about, there, there was, Renee talked about the click on the train. It's pretty funny. Um, when my husband and I got married, there were 24 attendees from the train that came to our wedding. <laughs> Yeah, that's how big our group is on the train. And so you try ignoring them on the ride home on an hour and 15 minute ride, it doesn't go well. But my friends understood that I was trying to do my discussion boards. We all know about those, right? <laughs> trying to get my homework done so at least I don't have to stay up till two, three o'clock in the morning. And that happened through the entire duration of my master's program. So on the way in, on the way out, I'm on my computer, I'm doing homework, I'm reading, I'm studying ignoring them completely. And they were fully supportive and, and were there for me and just left me alone. And, and the way of their support was just leaving me alone. Leaving me alone, not distracting me and letting me be. Um, my daughter was in high school at the time when I went back for my master's and we actually did homework together sometimes when she got home at the table. And we even got into a habit of putting our grades up on the refrigerator. And it became a little competitive, I will admit. Mom really wanted A's. Um, and, and, you know, that really helped motivate both of us. Uh, my daughter looked at me, she's like, how are you getting those grades? You work full time, you, you do all these things, you come home, but yet you're still getting better grades than me. And it really helped motivate her to uh, really attain uh, to getting A's, because mom's an overachiever. But we'll leave that alone. Um, but at the end of it all, I had a huge graduation party. And I invited all my friends and my family. And, and it wasn't about me. It wasn't celebrating really my degree. But it was, a cel it was celebrating the part they all played in my journey. And I made sure they knew that. So always remember to give thanks. Never forget those around you. Don't take them for granted. Because as much as you're on this journey, they're on there with you. And don't forget that. My fourth takeaway is to pay it forward. I originally started my career in finance and segued into information technology out of sheer curiosity and aptitude. I was lucky enough to have people over the years show me the ropes and got my first real IT job at Suffolk, which catapulted my interest and career in the field. And I knew it was going to be hard. Like I said earlier, being a woman in STEM has its obstacles and has its ceilings, but I was not going to let that hold me back. I wanted to pave the way for other women and women of color and to pursue their dreams. And my husband is in IT as well, and he even said to me one day, you have had to be so much smarter, work harder, and push further to get where you are than most men. And that's not opinion, it's fact, it's true, and that's okay. It is, it is society, it is the culture we're in, but you know that, you know that going into those fields, so you've got to be strong. You've got to have water rolling off your back and really thicken your skin because that is the, that is the environment you chose. <clears throat> I was really blessed to also have worked for a male manager that saw that I was being held back and my skill sets weren't being utilized. And he was really curious. He's like, why are you in the corner? I, I'm like, I know you're in IT, but they have you hidden. And I said, well, I'm doing my job, and my job is this. And he would come around and ask me different questions, and right off the bat, I knew the answers to all of them. So he started quickly realizing I knew a lot more than I let on. And so he asked me one day, he's like, what is your master's in? He was a new COO at the time, by the way. We went through a huge transition, and he came in. Real, real smart, fresh set of eyes, and, and said to me, why are you just doing this when you can do all of this? I said, well, I can, but that's not what I was hired for, but I'm happy to toe the line. Uh, we were shorthanded, so I started picking up pieces for, for different groups, and eventually he actually promoted me to the director of IT at that particular organization. So I went from being the director of IT administration, which is strictly budgeting operations and finance, to managing all of IT which is infrastructure, network and telecommunications, project management, operations, and the fiscal component. And 
That really was shocking for me to have someone actually support me in that way because that is an anomaly, uh, especially where I was. And I inherited a team that was unfortunately very downtrodden and complacent. Uh, they were all state uh, union employees, uh, so they lived to a contract. As, does anyone know about union contracts, union workers? Are you part of a union? Okay, so no offense to anyone. Um, it, it, you can get into that cycle um, of, I've been here 30, 40 years, I don't need to learn anything new. And unfortunately, in an IT department, IT being the operative key words here, you've got to learn, you've got to grow. Technology is changing every day, and if you don't keep those skill sets up to par, it's going to be really difficult for you to be competitive in today's market. And so within a year and a half, I actually took that team and completely revitalized and incentivized them. And all it took was someone being there, someone listening. Um, I was in the weeds with my team. I'm not just a manager manager. I, I say that the way I do because I don't just sit in an office all day and say, you go do this, you go do this, and you do this. I'm in closets doing patch paneling. If, if you know anything about IT, CIOs don't usually do that. Um, but it's to demonstrate to my team that I'm not, I'm unwilling, you know, I have a simple philosophy, actually, let me phrase it this way. I would never ask them to do something I was unwilling to do myself. And that builds me a lot of credibility with that team. So building that credibility, especially when you're coming in fresh to a new team, is really important. And it was also to help them. They were talented individuals. They were just, they gave up. They didn't know what else they could do. They didn't know what else to do with themselves. And they felt like their career hit the limit. It hit the path. And so, you know, that just listening, working with them, giving them educational opportunities, giving them learning opportunities, professional development, being by their side, understanding what they do, really, uh, really helped. So I took a lot of men and women under my wing to aid them in both their personal and professional growth. I volunteered with organizations for girls and women at risk, and I'm always willing to help a fellow peer or colleague. For example, Renee was telling you about our conversation on the train. She was having a really rough day. She wanted to throw in the towel. Statistics was getting the best of her. I, I've been there with statistics. Even though I'm an IT nerd, statistics is not my friend. If it's yours, I have so much respect for you and admiration because it is not mine. And so she just needed that pep talk. She needed to, to have someone that can understand what she's going through and just really keep her on track. And, and that was you know, one of the examples of just being there for someone. You know? And the reason why I do these things, it's not that I think I'm great. I'm not. I'm a work in progress. I'm not perfect. But I know how hard it was for me. I know the travels and the turns and the twists and the obstacles that I had to face. And if anyone can learn from my experience, and it could be a little easier for them, then I feel good about that. You know, the journey I undertook led me to the role that I'm in now. And without, like I said, those twist turns and, and obstacles, I may not be who I am today. And so the takeaways that I highlighted are really near and dear to me because I truly believe in their importance. You've got to learn how to hustle. If you want to achieve anything, for some it comes easy, for others, it does not, but this is where you've got to dig deep and find your fire, find your passion. If it's something you want, go get it. Do not wait for things to happen to you. Make them happen for you. Being your best self includes finding your best self, learning how to introspect, truly be honest with yourself. Hold that mirror up and say, am I being the best that I can be? Am I being the person that I envision that I'm going to be in 5, 10, 15 years? Knowing your strengths and weaknesses and making a priority to do better, be better. Recognizing that you have support, sometimes in the most unlikely of places. Renee never expected to find me on a train. You just have to keep an eye out for those around you and let them help you. It's never easy to be vulnerable and to admit you need help. It does not mean you're weak. You're simply strong enough to admit that you've reached a limit or that there is a better or maybe an easier way to accomplish what you've set out to do. And paying it forward. When you've accomplished goals, milestones, remember how hard it was for you and there are those that could benefit from your experience and guidance. 
Don't be afraid to share that, and don't be afraid to help someone else. Thank you. So I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that we were going to open up for questions. It's off. Helena, I got it. That was amazing. Thank you. We are opening it up for questions. Remember our theme here today is lead up. So you have learned a little bit about Katrina's story. Is there anything specifically that stands out that you want to learn a little bit more? Gail and I will walk around with mics, so just stand up or raise your hand and we'll walk over. I, one thing that just keeps coming back to me is you have a daughter. How in the world do you... Uh, you accomplished all this. How do you make time for your child and make this happen, business-wise and school-wise? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, time management. And I know it sounds silly, and, and hear me out for a second. I had to sacrifice a little bit of me, a little bit of sleep, because when she got home from school, that was her time. And when she went off to bed, that was my time to do my online classes. And that was one of the attractive reasons for me to doing SNHU online was because it gave me the versatility to do it on my time so I didn't have to impede hers. My undergrad was a different story. There were a lot of sacrifices around that time, but she was still very little. But again, I only went to school on campus on the nights she was with her dad. So she was with a parent. Um, and it was only one or two nights a week. Uh, so it took me a very long time to get my undergraduate degree, <laughs> a lot longer than I wanted to. But with the online program, I had the, the blessed opportunity to be able to go to work, come home, be mom to her for the next two to three hours, do homework, we hang out, we chat. Then she went off to bed, and that's where my workload picked up. Can you speak a little more about building credibility? Credibility is very difficult to build when you're starting at the bottom. Can you speak a little more about how you can go about building more credibility, especially when you have a predominantly male upper hand? Absolutely. No, um, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> so I have worked with mostly male teams in the last, I want to say, 10 years. And credibility is exceptionally important, especially when you're new. Um, even though I came in as a leader, I was new to them. And so they had no idea what my experience was, was my expertise. They knew I was hired to be the director of IT administration. What do you know about IT? That's where being in the weeds with them really helped me. Um, showing them, oh, yes, patch panel cabling. Yep, know about that. You know, you're doing an RJ45 on that end. Okay, great, no problem. Just knowing the terminology, knowing that having them realize that I knew my stuff and I was physically able to demonstrate that I could do those things, I earned credibility with them from a couple different places. A, they knew I knew my stuff, but I was willing to do it with them. It wasn't just someone barking orders or throwing out projects for them to do. You know, one of the key things I say as a manager, a lot of managers forget this, you have a timeline in your head, but if you don't understand how much time it actually takes to do something, you put unrealistic deadlines on projects. And so coming up through the ranks and actually working in an IT environment and learning what I did, I was able to really look at my administrators or my systems engineers and say, yep, okay, so that's gonna take about a week. And they looked at me horrified. They're like, yes, it's actually going to take a week. You didn't expect it in hours. I'm like, no, because it's gonna take a week, so get it done in a week, and that's OK. Um, and being a sounding board. Sometimes people just want to be listened to. They want to be heard. And I feel that if, in my experience, if you're simply there and present, and you're able to listen to them, to hear whatever it is that they have going on, 
that opens up a lot of communication between you and the other members. Um, and when all else fails, food. <laughs> I kid you not. Any, anybody work in IT? Show of hands. When you leave food out, how quickly does it go? I don't know what it is with IT staff, people, nerds like myself, the food's gone. Um, and, and that's a great way to also win them over. I'm, I'm like food for, for I, I, guys, please don't take any offense to this. Quickest way to a man's heart is through his stomach. It's really true. Give them food, they're happy. I hope that helped. Good. Katrina, thank you. And, um, through the chaos of daily life, the day-to-day -day activities of work, of family, of uh, schooling, how did you find your inner peace? <laughs> I was hoping not to get that question. <laughs> so I cannot tell a lie. Um, with my journey, I was terrible at work-life balance. I am still terrible at work-life balance. And that is one thing, if I can encourage any of you to figure out and find out quickly for yourselves, is that. Now, let's be realistic. We live in a society where work-life balance really doesn't exist. Uh, between the commuting, between the hours you have to put in at work, if you're an on-call individual, your phone is always by your side, we're always constantly engaged, um, social media, technology is always at our disposal. Um, I eventually learned to move away from the, from the technology. So I haven't found complete peace yet. I'm working on that, and one of the ways I do that is my phone is not next to my bed at night. It is downstairs. I do not look at my phone after a certain hour. If there is an emergency, I have a specific tone on my phone that tells me it's an emergency. Everything else can wait till tomorrow. So if you can code your phones, either color, flashes, or sound, to if you're an on-call person, you cannot be without your phone, I recommend doing that. That's one way to make sure that you're not looking at your phone every five, 10 seconds. If you have social media accounts, I strongly encourage you to stop looking at them at a certain hour and give yourself that break. For me, that was my biggest problem, was being attached to my devices. Um, I'll give you a funny story. I was, <laughs> this is really horrible, but it's funny. Um, I was hospitalized for a concussion, and the doctor said to me, okay, we don't want you watching TV, we don't want you, want you doing anything. And so, in true Katrina fashion, I had a laptop and two phones with me. Now, the doctor didn't realize that, so he walked out of the room, and I pulled out my work phone, and I'm like, do 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 doing work. He comes in, Miss Gomes, told you no devices, so he confiscated my phone and locked it up. Walked out of the room, pulled out the other phone. <laughs> Started working on the other phone. He sends a nurse in, apparently I was flagged. Sends a nurse in, she also confiscates my phone and lock it up. So she goes away, I wait a good 20 minutes, pulled out the laptop. Started working. I figured they finished their rounds, right? Anyone worked in healthcare, they usually do rounds. They don't come around for a while. So I was really excited. I was like, all right, I could get a good chunk of work done right now. Got the laptop out. Literally five minutes after, someone walked in. Yeah, I heard about you. <laughs> they took the laptop away. <laughs> and they locked it up. So I was deviceless uh, for a good solid three to four hours. And then I made my poor husband drive to Boston, pick me up at two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, this isn't working. Um, but uh, you know, that was my weakness. My weakness was being too attached, being too connected, and really learning how to put that away, put that aside. And so that for me is, remember when I said earlier, I'm a work in progress? That for me is that work in progress. I've got to learn to, to find those peaceful moments so I don't have complete work-life balance, but I do find moments. Make it work, work. yeah. I hope that helped. We've got a question back there. <clears throat> Katrina, so you indicated a lot of things or challenges that you face through your journey, and as students that have competing priorities, how did you maintain your inspiration, your most motivation to keep you resilient within your process? Whew. So I think what really kept me motivated 
Um, so a couple things. I've always had a fire um, ever since I was a little kid. I, I don't know where it came from, but it was my own fire. I wasn't sure what it was, and there were times I actually played with fire, but we won't go into that story. Uh, let's just say it resulted in a lot of newspaper being burned in a very safe way. Um, but I was, I was a very passionate kid. I was a very passionate child, and I always knew I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something great. I just didn't know what that was, um, obviously, until I got older. And I, I originally thought I wanted to be in finance and, and figured all that out, but I was so curious about technology that I started playing with it and really became very good at it and found other people in the field that taught me a lot of stuff. Um, I learn from my husband all the time, even now, because he's a senior systems engineer. So I'm always absorbing that knowledge. Um, I think what really kept me motivated was that fire, but also knowing I had a little human that depended on me. Um, my daughter, and she's my only child, um, I, made, I made a very conscious decision to have one and done. Just saying. <laughs> Kids are a lot of work. Um, so those who are parents of multiple children, bless you. I have, I have nothing but respect. Um, but knowing that I had, especially a girl, uh, she was looking up to me. And like us, our children learn by example. And so I think that really fueled me to, to develop and, and move forward and really inspired me, knowing that I had to be that example for her and make sure that I was the best parent possible uh, in her eyes for she didn't ask to be here, and I brought her into this world, and so the best that I can do is give her everything that I could and give her the best of me. And you know, a lot of it, like I said, came from that fire as well. I, I wanted to be better. I wanted to grow. I wanted to do things. I wanted to be in a position to help others. Um, I do work, like I said, with a lot of women and girls at risk organizations for human trafficking, um, for education. And so those are things that I felt that I know I needed to be in a certain place so I can help organizations like that. I hope that helps. Um, so here at SNHU, I'm, a, I'm majoring as a video game designer, and as my regular job, I work at Amazon, one of the fulfillment centers. <clears throat> and the one thing that I feel like is my, my biggest wall is feeling like I'm ready. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in the art side of the industry, so I, I'm constantly working every single day, and I'm constantly drawing every single day, 3D design every day, and I never feel, I'm, a, I'm my worst critic. I just feel like I, I always judge and always hate my work. And at Amazon, I always want to move up. I want to become one of the operation managers and maybe go higher up. So I always talk to my manager saying, like, you know, what's the, what, like, how, like, how long would it take? Like, what's the position like? And he, he's like, just apply. He said, you'd be very surprised that you could actually just land a job rather than just wait. So it's just that constant fear, like, like, I don't know if I'm ready, so I just keep pushing myself harder, harder working, trying to do different things. So my question to you is, like, when did you feel was the right time that you were ready? Are you ready to move up, to step up, to play, doing different jobs and what you are right now? Um, really good question. And, and being your own worst critic is actually not a bad thing. Um, being that critical on yourself can actually benefit you because you strive higher. You push yourself harder and you actually hone in on different skill sets that if you were complacent, you probably would not have acquired. So kudos to you for doing that and, and really being a little bit more hard on yourself, because I was too, and it actually benefited me. The confidence that, that you're talking about that really propels you into, I'm ready for that next step, sometimes you're never ready. Um, you just have to go for it. You, you've got to take that fear. I'll tell you right now, I don't know if anyone realized this, I was terrified coming up here. I, I do public speaking on a regular basis, but I still get really nervous, and I get very anxious before I do it, but I do it. I push myself, and it's the same thing with positions. I always looked for jobs that elevated me into a different role, into a different level, but that also allowed me to challenge myself. Um, being a manager does come with different skill sets. When you're an engineer, right, like a true designer or a true technical engineer, your soft skills can sometimes be a little bit different um, or a little lacking as what's required in a managerial position. 
uh, you do have to work on those. And so I strongly recommend that you take classes or you work on developing those skill sets. That will help your confidence. And that's the key, practicing repetition. I don't think you ever really get over the fear um, of something like that until you've done it a few times. And so if this is your first time trying to elevate into that role, I truly recommend going for it. What's the worst that can happen? They say no, or they don't look at your resume. But if they say yes, then you have a world of opportunity ahead of you. You're welcome. It looks like we have room for one more question. Who will be our lucky question asker? There we are. Hi. Um, what was your biggest fear moving into the STEM section from finance, like moving, being a woman in STEM? I am petrified <laughs> going into it now. What was your biggest fear? Um, it is scary. Um, it was scary for a couple of reasons because it was such a leap. Um, being in finance for as long as I was and moving in, and segueing into information technology, I think what I was most fearful of, and I think uh, you asked about it earlier, was the credibility. Um, being taken at my word, not being questioned all the time of, well, do you really know what you're talking about or are you sure? I think that was my biggest fear, but the only way to overcome that was making sure that you had the knowledge, that you had the credibility behind you, and I think that can alleviate your fears. Um, you will always have some apprehension or a little bit of fear going in, but once you know you've got this, once you know you've had this, it's, it's like, I know my stuff. I'm like, I can, defend my, I can defend myself. I have no problems doing that. I, I think that will help with, you know, for me, that's what helped me, was making sure I acquired the knowledge, I had the technical skill sets behind me. So when I segued in, there was very little or any room to question uh, my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Another round of applause for our keynote speaker. We're gonna see if I can get this in here. Also known as I don't know how to get this in here. <laughs> Can you hear me? All right, I'm done for the day. Whew. Christina, thank you for sharing your journey. Um, that was powerful and inspiring, and I especially appreciate the work-life balance tips. I know that's something that I struggle with personally as a mother, a student, and a full-time worker, so I appreciate you sharing that with us. Today's itinerary can be found in your SNU Leads program. If you open it up, you can review who the speakers are, where they're located, and what they're gonna cover while they're speaking to you. If you did not have a chance to visit the LinkedIn photo booth to take a free updated headshot, be sure to do so during our lunch session, again here in the back of the dining room.